SpaceX was supposed to launch the 25th Commercial Resupply Service mission to the International Space Station on June 10. But in a June 6 statement, NASA said the launch had been postponed due to elevated vapor readings of monomethylhydrazine in a portion of the spacecraft's Draco thruster system. Draco is a hypergolic liquid rocket engine that uses monomethylhydrazine as the fuel and nitrogen tetroxide as the oxidizer. The Dragon capsule is outfitted with 16 Draco thrusters for attitude control and orbital maneuvering. The elevated readings were detected when propellant was loaded into the spacecraft, and teams immediately offloaded the propellant and oxidizer from the spacecraft to allow for additional inspections and testing. NASA and SpaceX will announce a new target launch date once the exact source of the elevated readings is identified and the cause is determined. The thruster issue is the second in recent weeks to involve a Dragon spacecraft. NASA announced on May 24 that SpaceX was replacing the heat shield structure for the next Crew Dragon spacecraft, which will launch on the Crew-5 mission in September. Earlier in May, that heat shield failed an acceptance test. Please watch our previous video for more information on this issue. Link in the description. Egypt's Nile Sat 3 Not one communications satellite was launched on June 8 aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from the Cape Canaveral launch pad in Florida. The Falcon 9's first stage returned to Earth about two and a half minutes after launch, landing on a SpaceX drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean, a few hundred kilometers off the coast of Florida. This was the seventh launch and landing for this particular booster. Meanwhile, the Falcon 9's second stage continued hauling Nilesat to geostationary transfer orbit, eventually deploying the satellite there 33 minutes after liftoff. The roughly 4,000-kilogram Nilesat-301 satellite will use onboard chemical propulsion to start its journey within the next couple of days, ultimately arriving in a circular geostationary orbit nearly 36,000 kilometers above north or central Africa. It took nearly two and a half years for Thales Alenia Space to manufacture the Nilesat-301, and this new satellite will serve as a replacement for the Nilesat-201, which is expected to run out of fuel in 2028, after being launched in 2010. Owned by the Egyptian operator Nilesat, the satellite will have a minimum lifespan of 15 years in orbit. It will deliver communications and satellite broadband services to Egypt and neighboring North Africa and the Middle East countries. Despite positioning at a relatively clean area of space called Lagrangian Point 2, located 1.5 million kilometers from Earth, NASA's James Webb Space Telescope recently received a direct hit from a larger-than-expected micrometeoroid. Webb has already been hit by at least four different micrometeoroids since its launch, but all of them were small and roughly the size of what NASA expected the observatory to encounter. However, the one that hit the telescope between May 23 and 25 was larger than what the agency had anticipated, measuring likely less than one millimeter. The micrometeor smacked into one of the telescope's 18 gold and beryllium-coated primary mirror segments. According to the analysis, the mirror segment known as C3 was struck, leaving a dimple in the segment. Webb has an open design with no tubular baffles to protect its mirrors as seen on other space telescopes such as Hubble. Instead, the reflectors are hidden behind a massive sunshield, allowing them to maintain the stable cold temperatures required to detect infrared light. According to NASA, micrometeoroid impacts were anticipated, and Webb's mirror was designed to withstand bombardment from the micrometeoroid environment during its orbit around the sun. Furthermore, Webb's capability to sense and adjust mirror positions enables engineers to cancel out a portion of the data distortion. Engineers have already made adjustments to the C3 mirror that was impacted by the hit, and more adjustments are planned in the future to fine-tune corrections. NASA engineers also have the ability to steer Webb's mirror and instruments away from space debris showers if the agency detects them. However, because the micrometeoroid was not part of a shower, NASA regards it as an unavoidable chance event. Even though the impact occurred so early in the observatory's tenure, NASA officials are confident that the $10 billion telescope will continue functioning properly. Furthermore, the strike appears to have had no effect on the telescope's schedule. The mission team is still planning to release the first full-color images from Webb on July 12. NASA's Mega Moon rocket, the Space Launch System, rolled out to its Florida launch pad for a second time, paving the way for the agency to perform the wet dress rehearsal with the vehicle later this month. The 98-meter tall rocket began its journey at 4.15 a.m. GMT on June 6 from the Vehicle Assembly Building. The launch vehicle and its mobile launch platform rode to launch pad 39B on a diesel-powered crawler transporter. The 6.8-kilometer journey took approximately 10 and a half hours to complete. The Moon rocket has spent the last month undergoing repairs inside the Vehicle Assembly Building after a problem-plagued testing campaign, including three attempts to fill the rocket's core stage with liquid propellants in April. 
Now that the issues with the Mega Moon rocket are fixed, NASA engineers are ready to give the tanking test another go. NASA aims to conduct its fourth attempt at a wet dress rehearsal no earlier than June 19. According to recent reports, NASA plans to build a new mobile launch tower for future Artemis missions. The Artemis program's first three flights, which will culminate in a human lunar landing no earlier than 2025, will use the Space Launch System rocket's Block 1 variant. On the other hand, starting with the Artemis 4 mission, NASA plans to launch lunar missions on a more powerful and updated version of the SLS rocket, which necessitates the new mobile launch tower. NASA awarded the engineering firm Bechtel, a cost-plus contract for the design and construction of the mobile launch tower in 2019. The contract was estimated to be worth $383 million. However, according to a report by NASA's Inspector General, Paul Martin, the project's new cost estimate is $960 million and is already years behind schedule. The report finds that Bechtel underestimated the project's scope and complexity, and NASA awarded the contract to Bechtel before finalizing the specifications for the SLS rocket's upper stage. Despite this, NASA pressed for the construction of the second mobile launch tower to be ready for 2026. The space agency claims it had no choice but to proceed with the design and construction of the tower to meet the deadline for its lunar missions. Please check out the link in the description to read the report from NASA's Inspector General, which includes some of his recommendations. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After nearly a year of analyzing the potential impacts of the Starbase spaceflight activities on the nearby wildlife refuge and public beach, the FAA published the final programmatic environmental assessment report on June 13. The FAA has issued a mitigated finding of no significant impact for orbital Starship launches from Boca Chica, effectively giving the SpaceX project an environmental green light. The final report allows for five full-stack Starship launches from Boca Chica each year, as well as five suborbital flights of the Starship vehicle without Super Heavy. According to FAA, the spaceflight activities at Starbase would not significantly affect any of the environmental impact categories mentioned within the report. However, the FAA stated that SpaceX would be required to take more than 75 actions to mitigate environmental impacts before receiving a Starship orbital launch license. The mitigations include protections for water resources, limits to noise levels, biohazard materials control, measures to reduce beach and park closures, and safeguard fish, wildlife, plants, and other environmental resources in Boca Chica. The report also stated that SpaceX had made several changes to its proposal since the end of the public comment period on the draft programmatic environmental assessment in October. SpaceX, for example, has halted the construction and operation of the Starbase's desalination plant and natural gas power plant, and also modified the Raptor engine and engine configuration. SpaceX increased the thrust of the Raptor engine, lowering the total number of engines needed for space flight. It must be noted that the finding of no significant impact is not a formal launch license and SpaceX must meet FAA safety, risk, and financial responsibility requirements before applying for an orbital launch license. Please check the link in the description to read the final programmatic environmental assessment in detail. SpaceX's upgraded Starship prototype, Ship 24, has returned to the build site after completing a series of ground tests. The test campaign for Ship 24 began on May 27 with an ambient pressure test, followed by a cryogenic proof test on June 2. Two days later, Ship 24 was installed on the suborbital launch pad B for structural stress tests. SpaceX then put the prototype through a pair of structural stress tests on June 6 and 7, both of which appeared to be successful. The ship's propellant tanks were filled with subcooled liquid nitrogen for the test, while hydraulic rams were used to test Ship 24's aft section by simulating the thrust of six Raptor engines. After all those tests at the launch site, Ship 24 has now arrived at the build site. Next, the vehicle will be outfitted with three sea level and three vacuum optimized Raptor engines. Ship 24 will be the first Starship prototype to be outfitted with new Raptor version 2 engines, which can generate nearly 25% more thrust than the first generation engines. Once the engine installations are complete, Ship 24 will be rolled back to the launch site to begin wet dress rehearsal and static fire testing, which could eventually qualify the ship for the orbital test flight. The SpaceX team at the launch site is currently preparing the suborbital launch pad B for the static fire test campaign. A stainless steel test tank, labeled as E-Dome per a tracking label taped to its side, was rolled out to the launch site on June 8. This is most likely a test tank used to validate the new flatter propellant tank domes. These flatter aft domes, which require only 18 gores and one small cap, 
as opposed to the roughly 40 different pieces and three stacks required for each older dome, would simplify production and allow for ample cargo space. Moreover, despite being significantly more compact than the old design, the new dome should still be able to hold roughly the same amount of propellant as the previous dome. Following the tank's arrival at the launch site, it likely won't be long before the tank kicks off its cryo-proof test campaign. The primary goal of any test tank is to learn about new hardware, and the best case scenario of the test campaign would be either the tank's total survival, or its destruction well beyond the maximum pressure it was designed to withstand. Road closures indicate the test tank structural tests will begin as soon as Tuesday, June 14. The Starship orbital launch pad and launch tower construction inside the gates of Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center is progressing. Photographers from NASA Spaceflight.com confirmed that SpaceX has begun assembling parts of a massive crane that will stack the launch tower and install other major launch pad components at Cape. The crane that has begun assembling at Pad 39A is most likely a Lieber LR11350 crawler crane, the same type of crane that SpaceX used to assemble the launch tower at Starbase. Five of the nine individual launch tower sections have already been prefabricated at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. Once the crane is fully assembled and operational, the launch tower segments at Roberts Road will be rolled out to Pad 39A for stacking. The foundation work for the Starship Cape Canaveral Mega Bay is progressing at Roberts Road. Elon Musk recently shared a render of how the Roberts Road complex will look once all the significant work is completed. A box-like structure has been recently assembled at the Starbase build site. The structure has a short but wide door at its bottom, similar to the Starlink deployer door on Ship 24. This could be a structure for loading the second-generation Starlink satellites onto starships. SpaceX is planning to launch several Starlink Gen 2 satellites into orbit during the orbital test flight. Starlink satellites will be the primary payload for Starship as it gains flight experience before carrying other payloads and eventually crews. All 33 Raptor version 2 engines of Super Heavy Booster 7 have been installed recently. Booster 7 has already completed cryo-proof and structural stress testing in April. When the booster is completely ready for static fire testing, it will be rolled out to the launch site for the test campaign. Elon Musk has recently confirmed that SpaceX would proceed cautiously with its Booster 7 static fire campaign, initially testing engines one at a time before moving on to a full 33-engine test. SpaceX may begin with the inner three engines before moving to the middle 10 and then the outer 20. The booster quick disconnect plumbing shield, which was removed from the orbital launch mount after a fit check on May 23rd, was reinstalled on Saturday. The shield will protect the booster QD plumbing and electrical lines from the flames during the Starship launch. The construction of SpaceX's Star Factory, which will eventually replace all the construction tents at the build site, is rapidly progressing. Elon Musk recently shared a render of how the Star Factory will look once all the work is completed. Last week, at its McGregor rocket development facility, SpaceX fired a Raptor version 2 engine on a horizontal test stand for 385 seconds. It was quite possibly the longest second-generation Raptor engine test at McGregor. The previous record of 365 seconds was set three weeks ago. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.